Okay, I'd like to welcome everybody to session 17 on the book of Acts. Uh, we're going to be covering chapter 8 and attempting to get through verses 1 through 25. Uh, as that said, it'll be a challenge with this much uh, works and scriptures to get through at the same time the amount of depth. Fortunately, a lot of these are will go fast because some of it is just historical backgrounds and knowledge that we'll try to get through quickly instead of there won't be much discussion. But there's some items in here that are huge discussion items that might one question may take the whole night. So man, we're prepared for that. So uh, it really has some some things that open your eyes and it, it has some theological issues that are at debate. So we'll hit those as we go through this. But as you remember, we finished chapter seven with Stephen, the stoning of Stephen. Uh, we know that that stoning uh, was really not done according to even Jewish law. And it was basically uh, the Sanhedrin lost control of themselves and just went crazy. But it ended, if you remember, Stephen ended with prayer before he committed his soul and went up to heaven. And that was, you know, please don't hold this sin against them. Uh, that's what he asked God. And so I'm going to ask a question before we even get started. You think God heard that that prayer of Stephen? If so, why? If not, why? Well, of course he heard it. Well, but did he, did he act on it? Okay. Okay. That's a better way to put it. I'm sorry. <laughs> so. I always related that to the same thing that Jesus prayed on the cross. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Yeah. You know, and, and I've heard people say, well, that means God forgave all those people automatically. And I, I always struggle with that because I always relate repentance to forgiveness. Okay. So uh, that, that's, it's a tough thing. It, it, I don't, I don't know, if, I don't know for sure, um, you know, if they don't repent and, and maybe, maybe it, maybe it's Stephen's prayer and Jesus's prayer uh, stirred the Holy Spirit to convict their hearts and draw them to repentance. You know? and, and that's a, that's a good point, Robert. I think it's, uh, they are similar prayers. And we talked about the comparisons between Stephen and, and Jesus Christ. Uh, and it was, there are numerous, and one being the very last as he gave up his spirit, pray for him. Uh, and I think he's really praying, for, as you said, he's asking God to, if there's any way possible, don't hold this sin against them, but they still have to do something. They're not forgiven and they can just go on. But it's interesting to see the main person when we get into chapter eight and we start one, we'll see who it was that actually was pleased by his stoning. And uh, we'll get into that as we get into the first verse. But it tells us, at least it tells me, that God heard Stephen and responded to Stephen in a very certain way. And we won't see that until we get a little bit further down the road to Damascus. All right? <laughs> we'll, see, we'll see exactly how he handled it. So on the road to Damascus, somebody saw Christ and changed. But we're not telling you who it was. I wonder who that was. We'll have to wait till we get there. It's just a couple of weeks off. <laughs> so with that, I turn it over to Nett, and she's going to start with Acts 8, verse 1. 1 through 4. Now Saul was consenting to his death. And at that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentations over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. So what it was beneficial about this persecution? I think the answer to that is in is verse four. Mm -hmm. So Jesus gave the commission that he wanted them to spread the word in Ju Jerusalem, um, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And when the, all of the church started, it was very congregated 
in Jerusalem and they were not, they were not venturing out yet. And so what we see with this great persecution was a scattering. And there's two words that the, the Greek, there are two Greek words that the English translates into scattered. One of them is to scatter like ashes and they disappear. So you take the ashes and you throw them out over the ocean or the sea and um, the ashes disappear. That's one word. The second word is like with seed, you cast them out or plant them and then something grows from it. They're not lost. And so the word that the original word that they used for this scattering and this was to cast out like seeds. Which is a great analogy, which is a great visual and analogy because because of this persecution, um, Jews or the Christian, the church, which were Jews primarily, fled Jerusalem, all these different areas. And then when they got there, they were so excited that they started preaching. And so they were planting churches all around the area. So in this area, we see them going from Jerusalem into Judea and Samaria. Um, later on in Acts, we'll, we'll get to the ends of the earth. Yeah, it, it's like and that said, they're sowing seeds. So they're scattering the seeds across the ground, some on fertile ground, some on rocky soil, uh, some in briars. And so that's really what's going on. And one of the commentators brought this out, and I was, you know, interested about how he put this, but it's so very true. When we look at our churches today, we get kind of comfortable in our own little fellowship and congregation. And sometimes we actually need something to force us out of those walls of that church and to get out and spread the word. But well, we're just comfortable in our own little walls and we don't want to you know, take the effort of getting outside. That was what was happening in Jerusalem. They were all of one accord they shared dinner with one another. They shared fellowship with one another. They prayed with one another. They worshiped with one another. Everybody was good. Everything was great. There was no reason for them to venture out. And God used this in a very certain way to force them out to spread the word. And what he, what one of the commentators was saying, God expects every church to do this, not just his beginning early church. And many churches won't step outside of their four walls and really get aggressive about preaching the gospel or evangelism. And so this was kind of a message to the church as a whole, not just this original church, but also to churches today. So I found that interesting how it applies to even our own environment. Now, one of the questions that came up, which we can just read right over this thing, is who were the devout men that buried Stephen? And we really don't know, so I'm not going to sit here unless somebody really has an answer they want to get out. But the fact is, is that some commentators believe the devout men were part of the Jewish Sanhedrin that really didn't vote for his death. Oh, uh, I'm not sure it was actual vote because we don't get that recorded anywhere. But there was obviously some people there that weren't in agreement. You say, well, well how do you say that? But well, we know Nicodemus was there, right? We know Nicodemus was probably not in agreement, but we, we know he was of the Sanhedrin. So we know that some of those, so that one option is that. Another option is just Jews that didn't agree with what the Sanhedrin did. They're, they're not Christians, they're just Jews. And the third thing is, it was not all the, the disciples were scattered some remained in Jerusalem along with the apostles. And we're, we're going to talk about, you know, why didn't the apostles leave? Uh, but the apostles stayed behind and they, they didn't leave. So we don't know for sure. But one of the interesting things to think about is that it, we go to the end of the thing when he was buried on chapter seven and, say they, and it says they lamented over him. They mourned over him. And Jewish law prohibits the mourning in public on an executed prisoner. It's against the law. So they executed Stephen, yet there were devout people who were mourning publicly in lamentations and, and brought him and gave him the proper burial. So it's, it really, I think it's Luke's message to say, look, not all the Jews, not all the Jews were like this. And so his message to the world is there were some good Jews. 
And so again, again, that's all opinion. There's nothing to, to document that fact. So the next question is what is made havoc? And when we go back to the original Greek, because it says that, that Paul was making havoc um, over the church. And so the, the word, again, a better translation, it, it gives you the, it's like a visual picture and it gives you the picture of um, a wild animal just devouring and, and tearing apart its prey. So I can think of, you know, watching a, a documentary on the Serengeti and you've got all of the hyenas in there tearing apart a wildebeest or something. I mean, that is kind of, it's just devouring and shredding it. And so that's what literally um, Paul was in there making certain that he was just tearing the church apart. Um, one thing we notice is it says that he was consenting to the death um, in verse one. That's a little bit of a, uh, a again, too light of a word. The, the Greek word is really could be um, more better translated, like he took great pleasure. He was exceedingly pleased um, with this death of Stephen and to be playing a part in it. And he's kind of passive aggressive. You know, he's standing there holding the cloak so everybody else can do it. And I don't know the reasoning behind that, but we know that he took great pleasure in this. What we also know is it's easy to find fault with Saul right now, but we know later on, we go to later um, scripture in Acts, later accounts in Acts, Paul was deeply grieved over his role in persecuting the church. And perhaps what, even worse than causing some people's deaths, um, he found great pleasure in making um people from the church bow down in front of him with a sword to their throat and try to make them blaspheme God. And he really regretted that he brought people to the point of blaspheming God. And he, he did that. But you, know, you can imagine if you have, um, you know, a, a teenage um, Christian or a young woman and they've got a sword to their throat and they blaspheme God out of fear and immaturity in the faith. Um, and he just took great pleasure in that at this point, but later down the road, I don't think he ever overcame the grief of um, having played this role. Yeah, and as we get later in Acts, and we get in even the epistles of Paul, uh, it's pretty obvious Paul never forgave himself. He goes over and over again, bringing it, he never forgave himself for what he did. And we think about he asked God to take this thorn out of his side. There's some people believe that thorn was his unable to forgive himself for what he did. And so it's interesting if that's the case, but it's obvious that Paul, this was in Paul's mind all the way through his death. He never got over what he did, but he was so zealous, zealous in his persecution. He was more zealous in promoting Christianity and what he did for us. So God used all the evil he had and he turned it into all good, which is pretty amazing. So where do you think or how did Paul have the authority to go to house to house, arrest people and throw them into prison? He was, he was a Pharisee. He wasn't a temple guard. So where did he get this power from? He was a Roman citizen too, wasn't he? He was a Roman citizen, yeah. But this, this was not anything to do with Rome because this was arresting Jews for Christianity. And, and Romans didn't care about that. Go ahead, Robert. In chapter 9, verse 1, uh, Paul goes to the high priest, you know, to get permission uh, to go to Damascus, to get, to get letters from him to bring to Damascus to ask to uh, arrest Jews there. I don't know if that's part of the answer. It, it is. If you go to Acts 26, 10, all the way to chapter 26, what you find is Paul basically says he got his authority from the high priest. So that's exactly where he got it from. This was everything he was doing at was at the high priest giving him the authority to do it. And he was so ambitious about crushing, crushing the church 
the high priest knew that and they wanted to use him to just crush this whole thing about this whole church movement. And they felt they thought he was the best to do it. And so it, it turned on them, quite honestly. Uh, we'll see that later. But we, we don't have a question here, but it says the apostles stayed behind. And so we'll, we'll get into that a little bit. But why do you think the apostles didn't flee, but all the rest of the people did? And there isn't an answer. We have various opinions from commentators, but I think the best is that there was still work to be done in Jerusalem. There's still a basis of people that were there. Uh, and the apostles did not leave. They stayed to do that work. Now we're going to see that they didn't all stay. There's some ventured out. We will get to that in, in the next couple of verses. So there isn't a clear answer, except there was still work to be done in Jerusalem. And so they stayed behind. They, they weren't scattered. Maybe they were in a safe house. Maybe they were safe hiding. We don't know for sure. But I thought it interesting that Luke would even mention this in his writing. So there's a reason behind it somewhere in Scripture. So I thought it was interesting. So as we move to the next set of verses, Acts 5 through 10, it says, then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded to the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. But there was a certain man called Simon, who previously practiced sorcery in the city. And astonished people of Samaria claimed that he was someone great to whom they gave heed, all gave heed. From the least to the greatest, this man is the great power of God. That's Simon. So what we have here is Philip's leading. So who is Philip? Isn't, isn't that the apostle, one of the original 12, the apostle Philip? Yep, there is an Apostle Philip, but what did the verses one through four tell us? The apostles didn't go. So this is not the Apostle Philip, but it's Philip, one of the seven chosen, they say as deacons, or but he and Stephen were one of the, the chosen to administer to the widows and to organize the church. They were Hellenistic Jews, that were chosen by the, the church themselves to represent them. So this was really someone almost like Stephen. So this Philip is not the apostle Philip. So we found, I found that interesting. Uh, and it's, it, it is revealing to that as we get into this, uh, as to why we'll get into Peter and John in just a minute. But I thought this was really interesting that this is not the apostle going out. And note that though it's not the apostle, he's doing miracles, just like Stephen did. And so we said, well, they weren't apostles and they're doing miracles. You know, why aren't we doing miracles today and signs today like these people did? And, and that's going to get into that just a little bit when we get down further in the scripture. So I'm not going to get that now. So with the next one, we're going to go to uh, Annette and the next question. So what is a Samaritan? The person from Samaria. Okay, it is. It's a little bit deeper than that. So there's a little bit of history with it that kind of explains this this break between the Jews in Jerusalem and the Samaritans. So we know that the Jews <laughs> in Jerusalem absolutely hated the Samaritans so much so that they wouldn't even walk through Samaria, which was the direct link the direct path between Jerusalem, say, and Galilee. Right. They'd walk way around, extending their journey just to not pass through it. So back in when Israel was divided into a northern kingdom, kingdom and a southern kingdom, Samaria was part of the northern kingdom. And about 750 years before this time, um, the Assyrians came and invaded. And when the Assyrians um, invaded, they captured the middle class and higher class and well-educated Jews. 
um, and remove them out of the Samaria. And they left their pagan, you know, brought in a pagan race. Um, and then this, you know, these pagans started to intermarry with the low level, very simple, poor Jews that were left behind. And so they became a mixed race. Now, they, they claim to be blood relatives to the Jews. I mean, they, 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 they hold to that line. Um, but they, they, had, they believe very firmly in the, the Pentateuch, they, that they follow that word for word, and they feel like they're the true followers of the two letter of the law. And they felt like the Jews had kind of um, transformed it a little bit to fit what they wanted. Um, the Jews built a temple in Jerusalem, of course, and then the Samarit Samaritans built a temple in Gerizim. And so what we know when, remember, that when Jesus met the lady at the well in Samaria, for one thing, she was like, well, why would you even talk to me? Um, and then for two, um, she asked him, she posed him the question, like, well, you say that we have to worship in Jerusalem, but we worship here. And, and so we know that this was this ongoing battle with them. It was ongoing problem. Um, and so what, what we do know is that the, the temple in Gerizim was destroyed by a ruler during the Maccabean, Maccabean and of course, this is still B.C., um, uh, he was a Maccabean ruler, destroyed that temple because they considered it, and they really had kind of defiled, it was kind of this mixed um, religion. So even though they felt like they were following the Pentateuch more cleanly than the Jews, um, they had kind of worked in and, and interwoven some of these pagan practices with it too. So we know that this intense hatred that the Jews of Jerusalem had for the Samaritan existed, which was the primary um, theme or reason that Jesus gave the parable about the Good Samaritan, showing that um, it didn't matter that he came from this race or this background. He was the one who acted as God would have him act, and the priest and the righteous Jew um, did not. And so that that's so it's a it's very interesting history about the Samaritans. Yeah, yeah and, and like she said, they were considered an outcast, uh, and there was really what was called a schism. There was a great divide between their religion, what they claimed, and what <laughs> Jewish, uh -oh, call it Orthodox Jewish religion claimed. And so there was this divide between those two groups that. Is is went on forever actually. So, with that, the next question is: Who is this man Simon that we get into here? And we'll get into a lot more of him in the coming verses. But you know, do we know anything about him? Okay, uh, let me get into it because you know it's something. Unless you read and get into the commentary, it's hard to get much who this guy was out of what the scripture says alone. But Simon's name was Simon Magnus, which is almost like Simon the Great. He's a great sorcerer, uh, used, you know, witchcraft. He, he basically went after probably, remember, this was a more ignorant, more lower class section of people in Samaria. And they were many times more superstitious than the more trained people were. And so they were easily influenced by trickery and magic. And that's who this guy was. You know, he's actually what they claim comes from the Magi's. And, and the Magi's were known basically for astronomy and science, but they're also known for sorcery, for trickery, and for really on, on the evil side of sorcery. So, they were known for both things. And if you remember, it's the Magi who really came down to, to the manger. And so they were a group of people that are very knowledgeable people. Uh, they were all kind of different crafts. But it's interesting to see that this Simon was held with very great esteem. Uh, yeah, he, he was held by all the people of all rank. Uh, that he was from God, and that they really followed. He had a big, big following. Uh, he obviously was full of pride from that, that following. And, and what we get into as we see Simon, uh, 
he really is going to get to a point where he claims to, to, to believe. And so we're going to see him following through on this process. But the Simon himself, uh, he really, we have to question where his heart was. And so I want you to think of this guy as a magician using trickery, proclaiming God gave him the power. And now you have Philip come down here and all the people are, follow, are following Philip. They're abandoning Simon. So <coughs> that's the situation you have going on. So think about, about what's happening. Here's a man of great power. And now here comes somebody preaching Christ and people are following him. He's losing his following. And so now we'll start to see what he does, and then we'll see where his heart is if we can get to that final section of verse tonight of scripture. Does this, this verse 10, does this strike anybody wrong that the people called him great, saying that he's the great power of God? Does that strike anybody wrong? Can anybody really be the great power of God? <laughs> no. Robert says no, Bobby says no. No, no man can be the great power of God. But what we see here um, with the people at this time, they're not a whole lot different than we are today. We as a nation are so enamored with celebrity um, and fame and seeking out fame. And if not for ourselves, we very much are attracted to celebrity, which whether it's a, a sports figure or a um, uh, entertainer, musician, whatever. We're very drawn to that. No, it, it becomes a big problem. And we should always check ourselves very carefully when we attribute something to the man. When they're looking at this, oh, this man is the great power of God. Because we're looking at what this man is doing for God as opposed to what God can use this man to accomplish. So we want to be very careful with that. But but he was, as, as Dave was saying, extremely um, well-known, renowned, um, people flocking to him, people hanging on. He had his groupies. Um, you know, he was, he was that, and, and the fact that people would, you can see they're misguided that, and, that, and that he's misguided and that he even let them say that about him. Because would you not put people to a, to a stop? Would you not put it if they were calling you the great power of God? Um, we, I think most of us would probably try to, to correct that into a more true statement. Right. Thanks. Okay. I, have, I have a question on um, back on verse 7. Y'all have any, did y'all do any, get any comments on that or? Well, the unclean spirit. Yeah. Uh, there's, a, there's various opinions on what that means. Uh, and I've read some, not necessarily from this commentary, but one before what unclean spirits were talking about. It's really, uh, if a person is very sinful and full, full of immorality and uh, their morals are shot, they're considered unclean spirits driving their, their mentality and their thinking and their, their wants. And so a lot of people look at this as unclean spirits is that it's really a person's sinful nature and the spirit driving them. Their spirit is Satan driving them. And so that's the unclean spirit that's driving them. So that's one way to look at it. Uh, but there are also many that claim that they were demonized. Well, is demonized being possessed by demons? Yes. Uh, is it possessed by Satan's demons? Yes. So is it one and the same? I don't know, but it's from their behavior that most people say it's when they, they kick out these unclean spirits is that people change their view of morality and what's good and what's bad to what is good from a, from a Christian standpoint or from a, even a Jewish and the Old Testament standpoint. So that's how some explained it. Uh, I don't know what, whether that was what you were looking for, Charlie, or not. Well, uh, I mean, we can take this one the way it's written to look like demon possession. And what you'll want to remember, again, back at this time, you had a very pagan culture. And although, yes, we have paganism and Satanism and people that are kind of dabbling with the occult, 
um, now, but here you had a whole land or really a whole nation that was very heavy into occultic type worship and activities. And so we take this one to probably mean demon possessed. Uh, and, and yes, that uh, occurs today, but I'm not sure to the extent. I, I, I know that I've heard it of today. I'm, I'm thankful to God that I have never come across someone that I recognize as demon possessed or had to deal with that. But. Would, would, wouldn't, that be, wouldn't that be the same as, as calling or seeing evil? Would it be what? Evil. Yeah. People who are evil. Well, they're being driven by the wrong spirit if it's evil. So, yeah, that's probably included in there. Probably as well. I think you can, it, we can say definitely full of sin. Right. I mean, wh whether it's demon possession and they're really not. I mean, they're guilty by the fact that they availed themselves to be filled. Because we the, uh, can a demon possess you or I? No. Jesus Christ's blood covers us. You know, we are protected. Um, the godly are protected. So they can't just come in. So they've had to avail themselves to be possessed. But we don't really have an answer, uh, a black and white answer on that. Uh, we Maybe if we went back to original language and did some of that studies, we could find out, but we don't have it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Let's look at verses 11 through 13. And they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed seeing the miracles and signs which were done. So is there a significance of both men and women being baptized? The only thing that comes to mind with me is that uh, in the Old Testament, there was circumcision that was only for men. You know? In the New Testament, there's baptism, uh, and but it's for both sexes. And I don't know where to go with that, but that's... You're, you're definitely on the right track. You are on the right track. If you look at Jude Jews, if you look at Judaism, Judaism yeah. if you look at Judaism... It is really a male-dominated religion, and the interactions between God, it's between God and the male. What we see here is a departure um, from that practice into that Philip is going, he's preaching to everyone. Um, these people are coming to him with their belief. He sees no issues with their belief. And if they, they appear or if they, to him, he have believe and have converted and asked uh, Christ or recognize him as savior, he's not making a differentiation between male and female. And so now we have um, where Judaism was a, a male dominated or male focused religion. We have the church now that is focused on believers, regardless, male or female. And so it's kind of an interesting point. We needed something to put in here, but we felt like that was an interesting point to bring out that this is a departure from what has historically been going on. And women now are being baptized and, and being equal parts as believers in the church. Yeah. And Luke could have easily writing Acts just said they were all baptized or the men were baptized. He didn't. He pointed out men and women for a specific purpose. Like Annette said, Christianity does not differentiate between race, your color, your sex, or anything. Christianity is equal across all members of the body of Christ, all believers. And so this was Luke's way of proclaiming the fact that this is, this is a new view. This is Christ's religion. And Christ said, we're all of one accord. And so you see that there is no differentiation. Believers are believers, regardless of their, their race, their color. It doesn't make any difference, male or female, child or not. Child. They're all believers and they're all of one accord. So it's a very strong message that Luke is getting, but we can, we can take it subtly and not get the message. But most commentators said, this is a point blank in your face. This is different. And they're actually doing what Jesus commanded them to do. And that was baptizing all. 
And you know, from all nations and all kindreds and all that, he would, he said it, there was never any differentiation from Jesus as whether it was woman and man that we can see. Now, you might be able to find it. I didn't see it. I didn't do complete research. But who was the first person that saw Jesus resurrected? A woman. First person at the tomb was a woman. Who was there that was loyal to him at the crucifixion? The women. And he used women in his ministry quite often. And so I, I think it's a complete switch from Judaism, as, as Annette is saying. And that's the point that Luke is really getting across here, is that this is a change. Uh, and that's why he, he pointed it out so emphatically. Okay, uh, verses 14 through 19. Now, when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that, the, that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as of yet, he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that through the laying of, on hands of the apostles, the, uh, you know, through the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money saying, give me this power also that anyone who I lay hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. So now we're seeing some true colors come out of here. So the first question comes up, all right, we have the apostles back in Jerusalem. They're hearing Philip's doing great stuff, bringing people to Christ. Why is John and Peter now going to Samaria? Why Peter and John? That's the top two here, man. That's the number one and number two dogs. Why? They wanted, to, they wanted to give praise. They wanted to be, be part of it. They wanted to be of one accord. Yeah. Well, I, I think that um, just like the miracles were signs pointing to the truth, to Christ, that he was the Messiah, in a way, John and Peter were kind of the top dogs to go down there and to make sure the truth of the gospel was declared and differentiated against or to cut out what wasn't the truth. So you sent your best men down there, or people, to get that done. That's what I think. But what do you uh, think? What, what do you think their motive was, Dave? Well, I, I think there's multiple motives here, and so there isn't a right answer. I think that the first one is there's lots of people coming to Christ, and I think the harvest is great. The harvest you need people to go out and harvest. So it could be Peter and John are going down there to help with the harvest. As Charlie said, they may be going down to substantiate that it's the correct gospel being preached and they're coming to know the correct, the correct gospel. It, it's also, we find many of them that claim they went down to validate Philip's message. Kind of back to where you were, Charlie, but they went to validate, Philip is teaching you the right message. And so they're really validating Philip among them. And then the other thing that really is interesting, and I think it's got a lot of truth to it, is that they went to really bestow the Holy Spirit. But when you add to that, when you look at the Samaritans' Jewish laws and the Orthodox Jewish laws, remember they, we said there was a schism? There was a great divide between the two groups? And what was Jesus's command? It's one accord. It's one body of Christ. There's no separation. The, there's a lot of belief that Peter and John are going down there for the very reason to show they have the complete support of the Jerusalem, of the Jerusalem Christianity group. And they're validating Philip and they're coming in and bringing them as one accord. They don't want another schism. They don't want the Sumerians to go off and have their own Christ Christianity church in their own little group. They want them to be a member of the whole group. And, and we see why is, why is Luke going into that detail? Because we're doing that today. We have our little groups that have divided Christ's church 
up into religions, into some different th theologies, into where we got people who are, don't care for Baptists and people that don't care for Methodists and people that don't care for Catholics. And people. But we have a divided Christian church today in which is destroying us as, as a unity, as a one accord. I said this earlier. If all the Christians of the world would come together, it would be a power that nobody could avoid. But we won't. We're divided. And it's Satan's work dividing us. And that, I think, what Luke is saying here is he's sending Peter and John, he's sending the best in order to bring this one concept of one church, one accord, unity, unity among the group, not division. Not, and you know, division will destroy a church. Whether it's internally to that church, it, des it destroys it. And so the importance of unity is, is really stressed here. And I think it's, it, again, this stuff is very, very well intended by Luke and what he's doing. You can read over this and just kind of laugh. No, there's deep, deep stuff behind why Luke is putting the things that he's putting in Acts. So this, as we read this, um, really made us stop and look at each other. My question is, how is it that the Samaritans were saved and baptized, but they did not have the Holy Spirit yet? Because we find out that they did not, that James and, I mean, Peter and John came to bestow the Holy Spirit. So how is it that they were saved and baptized, but did not have the Holy Spirit? Does that, does that strike anybody else's, what is that? Well, what's were they were they were they still practicing religion? No, no. I'll just go ahead because we're kind of getting late. I'm gonna go ahead and just tell you what happens here. Well, it, Dave and I that that started the whole thing for this next question that Dave's gonna go in and talk about the differences of this, but this became extremely puzzling to us. Like I thought you got the Holy Spirit at, at, at salvation, and and how come they didn't get it? And so what we need to remember, and, and we were cautioned by more than one source, remember that Acts is a transitional chapter. This is a transition in the church. And they warned that no doctrine about the Holy Spirit should be taken from the book of Acts. And really, when you want to know the doctrine of what the Holy Spirit is and how the Holy Spirit moves and how it works and how it comes to play, you should be looking at the epistles to come up with your um, understanding and, and correct doctrine about the Holy Spirit. But we know that, that this is a transition time. Um, we know that, um, that, that the Holy Spirit typically comes with salvation. We know that, but at this time, um, again, as, as they were saying, I think that um, the biggest concern, and he already mentioned this, was that they would have their own, if they, the Holy Spirit came on them individually, that they might change away the church just as they had Judaism. And so the Holy Spirit was held back at this point for unity so that Peter, J, Peter and John would go and the same spirit in the same manner would be bestowed as it was at Pentecost. And we don't know exactly how it came on them. If we saw the fire, we don't, it's not really detailed and it probably wasn't quite to that extent or it might've been documented. But what we do know is that, that they did not experience the Holy Spirit at salvation. It, it came with the laying on of hands. But again, remember transitional book, uh, transitional time in the, the life of the church and we need to not get hung up on, on this or make this an argument on absolute division. or a division on absolute doctrine for Holy Spirit. But Dave's question. I'm going to go into a lot more detail on it. So what's the question? I'd like to, to know, you say they didn't experience the Holy Spirit at salvation. These the Samaritans, these Samaritans. Yeah, yeah. This well, Samaritans, Jews, Gentiles, salvation is no, salvation. No, this group, this group alone. No, we're, oh. we're talking about this group. We're not talking about anybody okay. else. Okay, but all right. it, 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 
what, 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 what I'm getting to, I, I'm not, I'm not discussing that or disagreeing at all with that. You, we experience the Holy Spirit in different ways at different times. I, I don't know if that, I can explain. Dennis, Dennis why what? don't we wait for the next question? What? We go into that because I'm going to cover all that you, I think. Oh, okay. And, all right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. I, I just think we're, I'm about to hit where you're going. So let me go okay. there and then ask okay. questions if I don't okay. cover. All right. As Net said, there's lots of things in Acts that we're not saying this is the way it is or it's dogmatic in any shape, fashion, or form. We have a lot of commentators that are saying, be careful on making any doctoral statements from the book of Acts. It's a transaction book, a transitional book, and it's not, there's things done in the early church that are applicable to our church today. And so we should use those things, obviously, where, where they're applicable. But there's a lot of things done in the, in, the, uh, in the book of Acts that we won't experience that again. And you said, what are you talking about? Why not sure we can see people with fires in their head and speaking in tongues when they receive the Holy Spirit? I, that was a purpose for a particular time. Yeah. You're not going to see the speaking of tongues as being, you know, a power that everybody gets when they go to get to salvation. There's some churches that believe you. if you don't have it, you're not saved. The point is, is there's miracles and, and signs. While we think miracles go on every day, and I do, I don't see people who have power like the apostles who walk into a city and heal the lame and heal the paralyzed and drive out. Of, you, you don't see that today. But are miracles happen? Absolutely. But they're not given to a group of people that can just go and do it. We have a lot of people that, that you know, can claim they can do this by their ministry. And most of that is staged. Most of that is not real. So the point that Annette was making is that Acts is a transitional book, and there's a lot of commentators that say, very, be very careful setting your theology over some of the things that are in Acts. With that said, as Annette said, the Sumerians did not receive the Holy Spirit at baptism. That, or at salvation. Or at salvation, because baptism, they proclaimed Christ, they were baptized. And we think Philip, Philip did everything he was supposed to do to baptize them correctly. So we don't think there was any error in that at all. So we just talked about the reasons why they didn't receive it. Now I'm going to talk about, out of the book of Acts, what is being baptized mean? And how does the Holy Spirit work? And I'm going to get into your, your question, your comment, Dennis. The fact is most commentators and most religions believe that upon your baptism and proclaiming Christ as your Lord and your Savior, the Holy Spirit is given to you to indwell in you. And it is sealed in you. Those things happen at salvation, almost across the board, every commentator, every religious denomination believes that is the case. So there, why these people didn't receive it was a particular reason for this point in time in the church life for why God intended it to come out this way. Going forward, no one believes that's the case. You're baptized, you proclaim Christ, you receive the Holy Spirit. He dwells in you, and you're sealed with him. Now, you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm going to get what you were talking about. Dennis. The Holy Spirit itself can dwell in you, but we have a lot of things that can stop the Holy Spirit from being really effective. And so to have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit can sometimes happen, I mean, all the time happens at salvation, but being filled by the Holy Spirit can sometimes happen at salvation and then go away. <clears throat> and then it gets refilled along the way and it goes away and it gets refilled along the way. So the filling of the Holy Spirit, as most things, is a sanctification process. As we grow in maturity, we grow more into the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to give you a group of, of a bunch of items to get you to feel what it's like 
to have the Holy Spirit filled in you. So let me go through these and then we'll just open it for, for questions. But for the Holy Spirit to be in you, I'm going to offer the following. And I pull this from different places. We offer our bodies as a living sacrifice to God. We do not quench the Holy Spirit. We do not grieve the Holy Spirit. And if we do, 1 John 1, 9 says, confess your sins because you've grieved the Holy Spirit and he will cleanse you. Okay, I'm going a little bit further than that. If we continue to grieve the Holy Spirit, God can promise he's going to chastise you. So you're going to get chastisement if you're going to be grieving the Holy Spirit continuously. One, two, grief, you recognize it, you confess it, you move on. You continue to do it, and you he may chastise you to a point to death. We gave examples in, in the epistle of John. We gave epistles, uh, examples in Acts with Ananias and Sapphira. We can't say that that's fact. And then you gave Paul in Corinthians that said, you know, there's people who's going to the Lord's table who didn't go to it in, in, uh, in full sincerity. So if you continue to grieve, then you could be chastised. Then it says you need to walk by and be by the, the Holy Spirit. And again, I can go through and give you all the, the scripture bases, but I'm summarizing this for, for detail standpoint. What does it mean to live by a walk with the Holy Spirit? It's the fruit of the Spirit. Go to Galatians. Love, joy, speech, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, goodness, and self-control. It's not one of those. It's all of those. You want to walk as Christ did? You walk in the fruit of the Spirit. So when, the, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you, you're obvious to people because you're walking in the Spirit. And when you're filled by the Holy Spirit, we see these things. We're co progressively moving towards sanctification. We have empowering of our spiritual gifts. We have spiritual gifts now that have been empowered by the Holy Spirit in us. We're being guided now by the Holy Spirit. We're not being guided by our sinful nature or by the world itself and the desires of the world. We're now being guided by the Holy Spirit. We have assurance of salvation. Who testifies about our salvation? The Holy Spirit testifies for our salvation. That's what the scripture says. If the Holy Spirit says, testifies that you are, now how he does that, I can't say that. It's the Holy Spirit that testifies of assurance. We worship. We worship and praise God. It says the Holy Spirit is in us. And the Holy Spirit, Spirit in, intercedes for us, constantly helping us in what directions. These are not my words. These are words of commentators I pulled together. And I'm trying to give you an example, Dennis, is that we all receive the Holy Spirit at salvation. The dwelling of the Spirit is there, right? We may not elect to use that spirit to guide us yet. Or we may. You know, that's not a given. But the Holy Spirit will be filled along the sancti sanctification process is the way many commentators put it. Now, I'm saying this as this is a fact. This is the only way it is, et cetera, et cetera. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is this is a views of a lot of educational scholars Take what these that apply to you, and if you agree to them, fine. Those that don't, that's your decision. I'm just offering the wide spectrum of what it means to be really filled with the Holy Spirit. When you are, I do believe, now I'm talking about my own opinion, I do believe you're seen by people. People notice a difference in you, a difference. They do. When you are filled with the Holy Spirit, it's obvious to people. And so what am I talking about? Simon, it was obvious to Simon they were getting the Holy Spirit. How? He saw they were getting it. So he, there was actually something he saw. We get time and time again in the book of Acts where it says Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit and he got up in front of the Sanhedrin. Or Stephen was filled with the Holy Spirit and got up to preach. So there's something about being filled with the Holy Spirit, Spirit that's actually recognizable about a person. 
That's how a lot of people try to explain this and the difference and try not to hang up on the Samaritans not receiving the Holy Spirit yet. Oh, one, one thing to remember too, even into the Old Testament um, and several times as Dave mentioned, some instances in the New Testament, people were filled by the Holy Spirit to accomplish a specific task. So we know, uh, you know, Samson, was filled by the Holy Spirit to bring down um, the, the, the temple and the whatever was going on. Um, David sometimes was filled with the Holy Spirit. Stephen was filled with the Holy Spirit because there's no way he could have composed all of that um, coming as he did right. cold. You know, so that was, that was the Holy Spirit working through him. So remember also that when they talk about people being filled with the Holy Spirit and then not and filled, Frequently, historically in the Bible, people were filled with the Holy Spirit to accomplish a task. And then maybe that we don't hear continued speaking of tongues like it was in on that day in Acts. Uh, we don't see that it, the fire, as Dave said, and we don't see the speaking in tongues by everybody. We're not all out there doing it. I'm not going to China and standing out there and everybody from all the dialects understand what I'm saying. Um, so it's not exactly the same. Right. And, and what we'll see too, what time is it? Yeah. It's early. Huh? It's time. Okay. So what we're going to finish up and we'll pick up 20 on next week. Here. There's not much there, but we, we're not going to go any further. We just fill this because Dennis, I want to give you an opportunity here. But one thing is that you run across is that when do you get the Holy Spirit? And I'm giving you what most people say. It's a point of salvation. The Holy Spirit is then indwelled in you. You become God's temple, your body becomes his temple because God doesn't reside in a building anymore. He never did. I mean, that was clear through some of the other verses we talked about that Stephen got into. God's not combined in a temple. Your body is God's temple. It's, it's holy and you're supposed to take care of that temple to do God's work. So, but when does he dwell in you? I think it's pretty much unanimous and through all the commentators that we've listened to it happens at salvation period and but do you get filled no not necessarily and you say well, what are you talking about okay let's go to the thief on the cross the thief on the cross believed in christ people say he received his salvation because christ said i'll see you in paradise tonight he didn't have a feeling of the holy spirit ever in his salvation life no. So he couldn't. couldn't have. And okay, let's take the 3,000 that was baptized, you know, when Peter gave his first sermon. Mm -hmm. They they were all baptized and all it said all of them received the Holy Spirit, but it's none of them were filled with the Holy Spirit as of yet. So it really it's kind of hard to, to segregate these things, but I'm trying to give you a view, and Dennis, because you asked a question and you, you, you followed up good timing right into where we're going. So now I want to give you an opportunity. Did I answer your question or do you still well, I, have I didn't, I, I, did, I didn't have a question. And yeah, you, you kind of hit on everything I was going to say. You know, that you said these people didn't, they hadn't received the Holy Spirit yet, but they were saved. They, they might not have had the Holy Spirit working in their lives like a more experienced Christian. But they had the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation. But they didn't know, they weren't uh, following it completely yet. Yeah. They, I, I don't know if I'm making sense. but Yeah, you are, Dennis. And I think the point here that we're trying to get across, and I'm trying to be careful here, is you're totally correct in what you're saying, except it wasn't applicable to these first groups of Samaritans. Because right they, here, they, it they, said they came down, prayed for them that they might receive the spirit because none of the, because he had not yet fallen on any of them. So scripture is clear. They'd only been baptized, but they did not have the Holy Spirit yet. Yeah, so either scripture is wrong. So, so you can be saved and not have the Holy Spirit. No, the Samaritans can the, be saved the, and the, did not have the Holy Spirit. Yeah. This only applies right here in these two verses. And yeah. nowhere else with Christianity. Right. Dennis, that's what we're trying to get across here. There's things you run across, not just in Acts, that are particular to that particular purpose. 
this thing about the Samaritans being baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, but not yet receiving the Holy Spirit, is all about what God's trying to accomplish as one church. And it's specific to this time period and these groups of people. And it doesn't apply to any other believer today that is being baptized. They receive it, as you said, of the Holy Spirit immediately upon salvation. And then they grow with it over time. Sometimes they have, they're filled with it. Sometimes they're not quite filled. Sometimes they quench the spirit. Sometimes they grieve the spirit. Why? Because we're all human. We haven't lost our human body no. and our human thoughts. And so that's all natural. And so, but by filling of the spirit, we start seeing these things less frequently and we move towards walking like Christ. Died. Remember the whole comment, the whole point here is to grow closer to, ha to Christ and walk as Christ walked, which is almost impossible until we get to heaven. But that's what we're asked to do. And kind of to wrap it up, like, again, just to kind of go what most people felt like, why did this happen to this little group of people? Why did this little group experience salvation and the Holy Spirit differently than other people? And it goes back to this thousand year or several, almost a thousand year history of Samaritans taking things and making it their own that was separate from the Jews. And they felt like that, that God, mm -hmm. they were making it more like a religion. Right. Well, yeah, division right. and a religion, right. I think whatever, whichever you said, both are right. But, I, but they really feel, and again, it's, you know, Luke didn't write um, well, they did not receive them yet because of this, this, and this. That would have made it really easy. And we don't need to get, I hope nobody's going to get broken apart by this. I, I just want to stress, this is only for these Samaritans that this applies. It doesn't apply today in any way. And it's also, most people feel like if, if Peter and John did not go and bestow it, and they received it immediately, this break between the two churches would have continued. But by waiting and coming from Jerusalem church through Peter and John, they shared in the same church and not something they were going to make their own separate. Does that make sense? This is a specific period and we'd be very careful what we're saying to make a theology about it. Because nobody claims that we read that this it's was ever any, happened again. It ever happened again. So any believer at salvation received the Holy Spirit. Only time that wasn't done so far from what we've seen is right here. And we wanted mm -hmm. to point that out so it doesn't confuse you. Well, when we it. first heard it, we were like, Duh, what? what? I just like you. What? What's what? going on? <laughs> right. Yeah. And so it took us quite a bit of research. And we that's how we came to find out that this really does not apply to Christianity today. Please, everybody hear that. This is not applicable today. This was only for this little group of Samaritans at this time. And then, it could happen. It could happen today. Right, but I say uh, it can't. It could, it but could that's happen. That's not what scripture tells us. That's not what most people say. Is that well, what did David? What did David scream out? David, Lord, don't don't let your don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. But that's that's Old Testament. That's all, yeah, that's Old Testament. We it, but it still have has to do with man. But it still has to do with man. No, it doesn't, Bob. We have the indwelling of the Spirit now, and David didn't have that back then. That the Spirit came, came and go. With on Christ. Christ. On Christ's crucifixion, he promised the Holy Spirit, I'm going to send you a comforter. The Father is going to send you a comforter. He's going to dwell in you. The Father, me, and the Spirit will dwell in you. That's all I know that. That's not all Christ's crucifixion. And not that's not that. applicable to Old Testament saints. They well, have had it. But they didn't have the indwelling of the Spirit, according to the scripture and the commentators that we're reading. So I'm trying to separate the difference there. And you may be right. I'm not saying I'm right or wrong. And I'm not, please don't take it that way. I'm trying to give you what we are hearing and what we are studying and what does it mean in, in that site. And, so let me ask you a question. I have one question. Can a person who is, can a person who is saved, he's saved. Okay, can he can, can he be saved and not read the word of God and not study the word of God and not love the word of God? Can he do that? You have to that's all. 
That's that's from the Holy Spirit. Right. And that that's that's knowledge and wisdom that he gives you. <laughs> and I mean, I mean, how does that happen? And I know a lot of people say, oh, I'm a saved Christian. I've been reborn. They don't read the Bible. They're not in the word. Yeah, I, I don't disagree. Bobby, but we're, we're not here to judge who's saved and who's not. That's God's decision. And it's oh, I understand that. I understand that. Yeah. But that's, that's, that is, that's something that we need to work out some kind of way. Yeah, I agree. But let me tell you where I'm going. Back to 1 John the epistle, if a person's pattern of life is continuously showing they're not doing and moving towards sanctification, because that's a process, then you got to question whether their baptism and, and their pro pro proclamation and repentance was sincere. Was it really sincere or was it false? And, and we're going to get into that next week because we're going to ask you the question, was Simon saved? He was baptized, but was he saved? And so what you're saying is very accurate. How can a person say, I'm, I'm saved, I'm baptized, but never open the Bible, never read a word, never do a Bible study, and may or may not ever go to church, and we'll but feel they're just fine. And continue in with the same sin. Now they're saved, but they still have their same sin. And their same pattern. And their life. same pattern. Nothing changes. There's no fruit or evidence. Um, that's where you begin to say, well, those... People, I mean, I would be very worried about those people. I and would I would too. share with them, I'd be really worried about that. If you can continue it's, it's, in the sinful lifestyle over and over and over again, and somehow you have a loophole and you can get around it, or you don't have to think about it because I'm saved, then, then you may have a problem. And I, I wouldn't want to be on that little tightrope. I wouldn't want to live like that. Oh, oh, oh I understand. I, I get that. I get that. I understand that. You know, because, you know, they'll tell you that, oh, I'm, listen, I don't. I'm walking good. Uh, I'm, I'm doing the right things. I do all the good things. But you don't read the Bible. And I'm in church, but you don't read the Bible. I mean, how do you know God if you don't read his word? He's talking to us each and every day. Creation tells us that, you know. But give a few minutes, a few moments, a few hours, whatever you have. You know, whether it be to reading the word of God or listening to, to, to Christian music, something, they'll get you on the right track. I see that too much. And I hear about it every day, every day. And, and it's bother, it, it's bothersome. I mean, it really is. You know, the conversation that Leo and I had, Dave, I told you about that. Right. I mean, you know, it, I don't understand it. You know, it's it's going to be too late one day. I agree. You know, that day's going to come around. We don't live forever. Yeah, and Bobby, that's part of the, the part of our ministry that really strikes home is I do believe a lot of people are proclaiming Christianity, and we're going to see that next week and why Simon is doing it, but it's – it's for a lot of reasons other than their true faith in, in the Lord. And so they're walking around with a false sense of they're good and very likely they're not. And I've heard statistics about the number of people that are sitting in church pews that proclaim to be Christians that statistically that's not the case. Uh, so I, I, I recognize your word and I, I I've actually mourned over that situation just like you do. Uh, but at the end, I know God can save anybody. He's sovereign. But I know a man can't save himself unless yeah. it's Lord Jesus Christ that he accepts as his Savior. And so That's what the Bible says. Yep. So anyway, I, I hear you. We're out of time, but I, I don't want to cut it short either. Does anybody have any other Comments, questions uh, to end the night. I knew that this we would get into a lot of discussion, and that's been very fruitful. We appreciate it. One of the things I think, Dave, when when Stephen was being stoned, and you asked what was, how was it worded? What was the blessing that came out of that? Was that the way the question was? Yeah, please don't hold this sin against them. Yeah, what, what, what they said. Well, what was the blessing that, you know, did you said, and that they went out after that or something like that, but. 
They went. They were persecuted, so they scattered the church out, which Jesus yeah. didn't want you to go out, and they wouldn't because they were an uncomfortable thing. The other thing that we see is he took the worst of the the worst of that group, Saul, and Saul gets converted. And his zeal yeah. for Christianity is more than his zeal for his hated hatred of the church as a Pharisee. So you come, you see a complete conversion. So God used Stephen, in my opinion, to get to Saul. And thank God Stephen got to Saul because we wouldn't have the New Testament. I think Stephen's got to, Stephen has gotten to all of us. It was where my mind went, and I agree with what you said 100%. My mind went to, we're reading, and today when we read about Stephen, it 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 warms our hearts. It teaches us. The people of that day saw that. And you were talking about, you know, you, you can start talking to somebody that's not a Christian, but if they don't see Christ in you, they might not even know what they're looking at. Right. You, you, you're just wasting your time with this book. Great. Right. So we, we appreciate everybody's discussion and interchange. Uh, please, if you have any other comments or questions on this, let us know, and we'll try to bring it up next week. Uh, and remember what Annette said. We start at 530 next week Central Time. Uh, God be willing, we'll be in Puerto Rico if something doesn't change. <laughs> so wish you safe travels, and y'all have a great night, a great rest of the week, and thank y'all, thank y'all, thank y'all for your participation. It's so when are, when are you leaving, Dave? Uh, we're leaving Thursday. Okay, I'll put safe travels, Dave. Travel. That's why. That's why I want to know. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right, we're finished up. We'll have that end in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. I pray that you would take these words that we've talked about tonight and meditate them. I mean, help us as we meditate on them. Speak to our hearts. Help us to come to the right understanding. You, you know you crafted this Bible specifically for us. And as Bobby said, you want us to know you. And so we crave and we ask and we beseech that you would give us the understanding for this. Because it is much more important for us to know truth. Um, than to be perceived as right. So we just want to know your truth. Please be with us. Our prayer request, <clears throat> we lift your name on high. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.